Hi, my name is Wan Sara, and I will start off our presentation today on the counselor as a person and as a professional. So who we are as a person and a professional are integrally related. Our personal life impacts our professional life and our professional work affects us personally. So as counselors, we ask our clients to look honestly at themselves and to choose how they want to change. It is also essential that we are open to the same kind of reflection on our part. In every therapy session, we bring our human qualities and the experiences that have influenced us. If we hope to promote growth and change in our clients, we must be willing to promote growth in our own lives. Our most powerful source of influencing clients in a positive direction is our living example of who we are and how we continually make decisions about the kind of life we want to live. So I'll be diving into transference and counter-transference. So transference and counter-transference are fundamental aspects of every treatment relationship and awareness of them both by therapists and patients are crucial to successful work. Our ability to recognize and understand them as they present themselves in the treatment relationship offers a unique and significant opportunity to talk with our patient about their patterns of interaction with us and other meaningful people in their lives. So it makes sense that as a clinician, you may be triggered by a client or you remind the client of someone they know. However, transparency and counter-transparency can be areas that cause the most significant issues for you as a clinician. Mm -hmm. Counselors must be aware of the influence of their own personality and needs. The therapist's self-awareness and ongoing observation of themselves and willingness to talk about what's going on between themselves and their patient are central on the ongoing therapeutic work. So, transference. What is transference? It is projecting irrational feelings and attitudes from the past onto people in the present or a redirection of feelings about a specific person onto someone else. So in therapy, this refers to a client's projection of their feelings about someone else onto their therapist. Counselors need to be aware of their personal reaction to a client's transference. And also, all reaction of clients to a therapist are not to be considered transference. So now let's look at some of the examples. We have Okay, for example, the client places unrealistic demands on you, you know, asking for more than you could offer, maybe. Or when a client admires you and tells you how much they remind you of someone in their life. Or when a client displaces anger onto you during a session when talking about his abusive parent. So here we have a case study, which is the case of Mallory. So a patient named Mallory expresses her transparency to Dr. Santos when she expressed that she feels bad for making her therapist spend time listening to her stupid complaints. She states, I'm sorry, I know I'm boring you. You're probably thinking you have more important things to do and there are other clients who need more help than me and you're just wasting your time. So this statement clearly shows that the patient is using transparency against Dr. Santos. This could be due to the past-built relationships that the patient experienced. According to Sherry, 2013, she's hoping to be married or seriously involved with a romantic partner, but she wasn't at that time. So this could show that the patient was pursuing a relationship but may have failed due to her depression or from her transference from past relationships onto newer ones. Now let's move on to counter-transference. Countertransference is when clinicians transfer their feelings onto their clients. It's the therapist's total emotional response to a client, including feelings, associations, and fantasies. It can be either a constructive or a destructive element in the therapeutic relationship. But not all countertransference is problematic. It can be an excellent reminder that clinicians are human beings with feelings and emotions. When clients open up, they can cause a strong emotional reaction and the experience of the clinician can affect the outcome of the session. So as a clinician, you need to be aware of counter-transference at all times.
Now let's look at some of the examples. Being overprotective, you see yourself in your clients. You have no boundaries with the client, like developing sexual or romantic feelings for a client or desiring a social relationship with them. Other than that, giving advice compulsively, not listening to the client's experiences or inappropriately disclose personal experiences during the session. Now let's look at a case study for counter transference. Here we have Jamie Gutierrez. He is a mental health trainee at a medical center. He has a client with PTSD and BPD who tells him that she can't trust him and her psychotherapist who is said to be harsh and cold. He wants to help her so he goes above and beyond with his efforts to place her in appropriate housing, get benefits, and so on. In fact, the client doesn't even lift a finger. Jamie does all the work for her. By doing this, he hopes that this will show her that he is on her side and can be trusted. However, after talking to his supervisor, he discovers that the client's previous psychotherapist was a warm and helpful expert in treating BPD. This is when Jamie realizes that he has taken the client's transference as reality and that he has some personal counter-transference issues around rescuing people who are helpless. He realizes soon that the client will see him as harsh, cold, and demanding and describe him in this way to other staff. So to wrap this all up, by simply understanding how transference and counter-transference work, often help both therapists and their clients avoid getting caught up in these dynamics. Mindfulness is a complementary skill that allows both individuals to better understand their own feelings and behaviors. And when both therapist and client can gain an objective view, they can actually learn from instances where transference or counter-transference begin happening and then take steps to deal with it efficiently. So that is all for me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Aza, and first I'll talk about counselors are also human beings. So we all know that there's a stereotype where counselors are perfect. Some people do believe that counselors have their own lives all worked out, have perfect relationships with their families, they don't cry or get angry, even when life gives them lemon, they always make lemonade. Of course, all of this is just stereotypes. It's not true at all because counselors, like the rest of us, are also human beings. For example, counselors are also capable of feeling emotions. So, there are certain cases where counselors do believe that they can control everything, and obviously, this kind of mindset can become dangerous to their mental and physical state because sooner or later, they are going to feel the burden that comes with this job. The stress is just going to accumulate to the point where they might just as poor or worse feel numb. That is why it's important for counselors to have self-awareness. Well, actually, in any kind of job, you do need to have self-awareness. But in this case, I do think that counselors and other health practitioners are a bit unique because their job scope is to help other people feel better physically and mentally. And especially counselors, they need to build relationships with their clients. And it can get tiring because gaining other people's trust you know, is most of the time is not easy. And at the same time, you know, while gaining their trust, uh, the counselors need to remain professional. So it can get stressful and it could also cause their anxiety level to increase. That is why it's important for counselors to have self-awareness because when they have self-awareness, they could avoid taking actions that could be unethical. So when counselors have self-awareness, they are aware of their own biases, denials and unresolved conflicts. By being aware of these three things, it could prevent the counselors projecting their influence on the client. For example, different political views. So what happens if counselors don't have self-awareness? It could lead to unresolved personal issues. For example, a counselor has issues with their child behavior, and when they meet with their child client that is, who is also problematic, the counselor may project their negative feelings or they may have a desire to fix the child client as a way to compensate with their own child problem. 
So these are the consequences of unresolved personal issues. The first consequence is the need to tell people what to do. It can reach from the clients, family members and friends. The second consequence is having a strong desire to relieve all pain from clients. By doing this, the, counsel the counsellors might feel that their issues are resolved. The third consequence is the need to have all answers and be perfect. And lastly, the fourth consequence is the intense need to be recognised and appreciated. Moving on to stress, counselling can be a hazardous profession because, for example, counsellor must not show negative emotions even when the client is standing close or disturbing things. Furthermore, if the counsellor is not taking care of themselves and focuses more on the client's problem, it can lead to empathy fatigue. So according to Shell Cross, empathy fatigue occurs due to the counsellor continuously hearing clients' life stories of chronic illness, illness, disability, trauma, grief and loss. And this can be devastating as it affects our emotional and physical health. Based on a research study done in the United States, over 50% of individuals feel that stress has impacted negatively on their work performance. Some sources of stress for counsellors are feeling like they are not helping their clients, they have the tendency to accept poor responsibility for clients' progress, feeling uh, pressure to quickly solve clients' problems, and having extremely high personal goals and perfectionistic strivings. According to Smith and her colleagues, when out is a state of emotional, physical and mental exhaustion caused by excessive and prolonged stress. It occurs when you feel overwhelmed, emotionally drained and unable to meet constant demands. If the stress continues, the counsellors might start to lose interest and motivation. So these are the seven signs of therapist decay, which are an absence of boundaries with clients, excessive pre preoccupation with money and being successful, taking on clients that exceed one's level of professional competence, poor health habits in the area of nutrition and exercise, living in isolated ways both personally and professionally, failing to recognize the personal impact of clients' struggle, and resisting the personal therapy when experiencing personal distress. Additionally, if counselors do not resolve with their burnout issue, it could lead to impairment. According to ACA Code of Ethics, impairment is described when a counselor or counselor in training has physical, mental or emotional problems that would prevent them from providing professional services as they are likely to harm a client or someone else. Therefore, if the counselor is impaired, it is better to stop providing any services. To avoid stress, burnout and impairment, counselors need to recognize their limitations. The first thing they can do is set boundaries. If a client starts to show emotional attachment, the counselor should inform the client about it in order to avoid further hurting the client's feelings and also avoid any competitions for the counselor's side. Second, counselors should know when to say no to their clients. For example, a client is having a disagreement with their spouse after working hours and the clients ask the counselor to come and talk to their spouse. At this point, the counselor should say no because if not, the client may start to become dependent. Lastly, if the counselor thinks that they can't handle their client's problems, the counselor should refer to, uh, the client to other counselors that are better suited for the client's needs. To distress, counselors should do activities that lift up their mood. It can be anything like music, dancing. The next slide is about personal therapy for counselors. According to Stevens, since the nature of counselor's job has a higher risk for emotional distress, counselors need, if not more, support than the average person. So the benefits of the therapy is trainees can learn from experienced practitioners and vice versa. Next, counselor can explore their values and motivations for becoming a helper. The third one, how their needs influence their actions and how they use power in their life. The fourth one is to identify and explore the blind spots and potential areas of counter-transference and lastly, for remediation purposes. So there are two types of therapy, formal therapy and informal therapy. For formal therapy, the activities are individual therapy, 
group counseling, consultation with colleagues, and continuing education. As for informal therapy, they are meditating, engaging in spiritual activities, and vacations. And that's all from me. Thank you. Good day everyone, my name is Sanskriti and today I'll be talking about the challenges counsellors face in professional settings. The first challenge will be counselling reluctant patients, patients who aren't willing to open up during the counselling session. This might be from shyness, embarrassment, guilt or lack of commitment. Besides that, for some people, they might not come to counselling sessions willingly. Their parents or guardians push them into getting professional help. People who are forced to meet a counsellor might be displaying rebelliousness. It can be challenging for a counsellor to accurately address certain issue without enough information. It is also hard to build a report without enough dialogue going on. Deborah, when we spoke on the phone um, during the week, you were explaining to me that, um, that your boss had asked you to come in today and have yeah. a, a chat about mm. some of the stuff that's been going on at work recently. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly... She is just such an idiot. Um, I'm really annoyed about this whole situation. Right. This is just a waste of my time as far as I'm concerned. Right. You certainly sound annoyed even right at the mm-hmm. start here of our yep. session. What's the reason that she's asked you to come in? Oh, God. She had a whole bunch of these like little training nurse people running to her and complaining about how I manage them. And it's... It's outrageous. You know, they come in, they're hardly trained. I don't know what they do at universities anymore with these people. But, you know, this one, did a shockingly bad attempt, which she called giving it an ejection. It was just ridiculous. And then, you know, like the minute you sort of like say to them, this is a problem, be professional, pull your act together, off they trot with their little tails between their legs, like, you know, whinging about my behavior. Right. And now I'm sitting here with you. Right. I mean, no offense. I'm sure you're great at what you do, but like... I could be out there doing my job. Right. So, it, I mean, the impression I'm getting from you is that you don't, it's not something that you really see the need to do to come in here, but it's something that you've been kind of God, all forced this into talking doing. Talking about your feeling stuff. I mean, no, it's not my scene. Right. right. So, um, what was, I mean, I take your point that you, know, that you seem to see that some of these other nurses that are working with you haven't done their job well and and the way you describe it there it sounds as though you're just doing your best attempt to kind of improve their skills yeah. improve their training yeah. if i was to ask your boss what when, what was the issue that she took with the way that you were handling this she said that i was being too aggressive and that i was can you believe it like messing with their self-esteem as though it's my job to look after their little self-esteem problems right you know, either they do the job or they don't. Okay. And so I was just being very clear saying, that was just a ridiculous thing you did. This is how you should do it. Get it right. You know, it was just being clear. Okay. And that's what she meant when she was saying aggressive? I presume so. Mm. I mean, it's just like, you know, when I did my training and went through all of this stuff, you just did as you were told and you got things right. You didn't run around worrying about how you felt about it. Next, uh, putting our own personal judgment aside can be challenging. As a counsellor who lives in a multicultural country, we will face clients from different backgrounds who hold beliefs that contradict our own. We have to check our own beliefs at the door and assess client circumstances on their own terms during counselling sessions. As a counsellor, we should respect clients' point of view, cultural norms and religious beliefs, even though we have our own religious values and political stances. It is counsellors' commitment to provide an equal and fair service to all clients, regardless of race, ethnicity, culture, and socioeconomic status. The third challenge is to avoid getting romantically involved with the client. It is important to set guidelines with clients to ensure that the association between counsellor and client remains strictly professional. With establishing appropriate personal and professional boundaries, a collaborative relationship with the client can be formed. Client's dependency. So while client's dependency can be challenging for a counsellor, some clients can be uh, very emotionally dependent on their counsellor, especially for those clients who have dependency issues. 
clients can be dependent with the counselor to a certain degree because it will make them to feel comfortable and safe uh, in sharing their problems. This is like a temporary and controlled dependency. On the other hand, there are clients who can become overly dependent on the counselor. The clients will keep asking help to solve their problems and won't be dependent on themselves if the counselor did not set some rules. It is important to talk with the clients about the limits to avoid overly emotional resilient clients. The counselor is responsible to encourage client independent thinking, decision making and deter all forms of client dependency. Lastly, counselors need help for themselves because they can neglect their own uh, mental health sometimes. Counselors might feel sad after hearing clients head wrenching, uh, I'm sorry, after hearing clients heart wrenching stories. Uh, this can be negatively affecting the quality of their work. Therefore, counselors can join a support group or discuss their feelings with their supervisor or friends. Doing so is often uplifting. Just as exercise helps us take care of our bodies, mindfulness is a skill that keeps our minds healthy. Mindfulness helps us perform at our best and better navigate the inevitable ups and downs of life. Mindfulness is noticing and being curious about what's happening right now. It's the opposite of being on autopilot, when our bodies are doing one thing and our minds are somewhere else, often thinking about the past or worrying about the future. When we're mindful, we engage our senses deliberately and we really take in the things that we can see smell, hear, taste, and touch. Just as we can build our muscles by going to the gym, we can build our mindfulness muscle through regular practice, known as meditation. All it takes is a few minutes a day to see the benefits. So find the time. Your mind will thank you for it. One way to control counselors' emotion is to practice mindfulness because as a counselor, we might have to deal with various situations and people. So mindfulness is an ability to, fully, to be fully present in the moment and have awareness of what we are or what we are doing at the moment. It is important for every counselor to possess this trait as it will help to reduce the overwhelming sensation of what is going on, especially during a counseling session with a client. Mindfulness can be developed uh, through maybe meditation. The benefits of mindfulness are it helps to cultivate awareness and observe our thoughts and feelings as they are. It also helps a person to become non-judgmental and to be patient when, in any kind of situation. Besides that, mindfulness provides a sense of acceptance and trust. So that is all from me for today and uh, thank you very much.